we're seeing the advantage of being in this room. People can grab the extra scone, the last cup of coffee, etc., and race back and get it. So, all right. Well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and in welcoming you to the last of the science and research breakfast seminars for the year, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation, and pay my respects to their elders past, present and future. I'd also like to pay my respects to the custodians of this building, the, the, the Parliament of New South Wales, and thank the parliamentarians here for hosting this seminar series through the year. And um, so it's, it's wonderful to come here and actually use these great facilities and um, particularly the wonderful catering. So we end this year's seminar series with a, with a different style of seminar and we're um, very, very lucky that we're ending on a, on a high note with Leslie Hughes as our speaker. Leslie's the Distinguished Professor of Biology and Pro Vice Chancellor Research Brackets, Integrity and Development, I have to read that one, that's a great title, better than mine, um, at Macquarie University, and very well known as an ecologist, but globally known as a climate scientist, and you know, served on many committees, advised many governments, obviously a lead author on, the IPC, on various IPCC reports, um, on the Climate Commission, on the Climate Council, advised New South Wales government, advised the Tasmanian government, advised governments all over the place and has a very s strong um, view on what scientists should do with, with regard to climate change. Not everyone agrees, as we know about climate change, but even as to what to do. And it's always wonderful to hear a very articulate presentation as to a way of presenting the issues around climate change, and that's what we're going to hear this morning. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Leslie Hughes. Good morning, everybody, and thank you all for coming out so early in the morning. I'm not much of a morning person, and the concept of a bre breakfast talk has always sort of puzzled me. Um, but thank you also, Mary, for uh, inviting me, and thank you, Mark Westerby, who suggested I come. Um, because it's early in the morning, I'm going to begin this talk with a very, very tiny piece of audience participation. And I'm going to ask you if anybody in the audience knows who this is. Anyone? Nobody's willing to say. Okay, his name is James Hansen. So you've heard of him now. Would anybody like to guess where he was giving this speech and what year he was giving it? US Congress, close, Brian? Yeah. 30 years ago, yeah. 1988, James Hansen testified to the US Congress... Where am I pointing this? And this is what he said, amongst other things. It's time to stop waffling so much and say that the evidence is pretty strong that the greenhouse effect is here. Slight quibble. He meant the enhanced greenhouse effect, of course. And I'm showing James Hansen at the beginning of this talk because in many ways his personal journey and professional journey is emblematic of the themes that I want to discuss. And I'm going to come back to him at the end. Where should I be pointing this? Yes, I am. OK, here we are. All right, so I have sort of four components to this talk. I want to talk very briefly about what we knew about climate change and when, why we should care about it, why the message seems so hard, and how should we as scientists respond. So I'll begin with a very, very quick romp through some of the leading lights of climate science and begin, of course, with Jean-Baptiste Fourier, um, better known for Fourier transform, Fourier theory, Fourier law. Brilliant French mathematician and physicist who, amongst other things, realised that the Earth should actually be cooler than it was based on the size of the planet and how far it was from the sun. He said it really should be much, much cooler. And the fact that it wasn't cooler meant that from a theoretical perspective, there must be a, some sort of insulation around the Earth. So he sort of discovered the greenhouse effect without really calling it that, and he published a paper in French in 1824 to that effect. 
John Tyndall, <coughs> that handsome gentleman there, in 1859, is usually or has been credited with being the first person to actually measure the absorptive qualities of different sorts of gases that we now call greenhouse gases, um, thus sort of proving that the greenhouse effect could actually exist. But in fact, in the last couple of years, we've just found out... Sorry, I'm really not doing this that he was beaten to the post by three years by a woman, no less. Fascinating person, no picture available, somewhat typical, Eunice Newton Foote. She had actually done empirical experiments um, in the early 1850s and showed and measured the absorptive, quantity, uh, absorptive capacities of different greenhouse gases. Her work was presented in 1856 to a learned conference, but it was presented not by Eunice, but by a man. Um, and amongst other things, she said, the highest effects of the sun rays I have found to be in carbonic acid gas, and we now know that to be carbon dioxide. Arvid Högbom, uh, probably don't pronounce that right, a Swedish chemist, was the first one to quantify the sources of carbon in the carbon cycle and estimated that natural and human sources were about equivalent. Then the brilliant Svante Arrhenius, who, amongst other things, realised, based on Hogbom's calculations, that this could eventually lead to the warming of the planet. And he estimated that if we doubled the CO2 of that time in the atmosphere, it would lead to about a five to six degree warming. And he got it pretty spot on. He did, however, predict that this would take a very, very long time, thousands of years, and who could blame him for underestimating the speed of industrial transformation of the planet? Sorry. Following up, moving into last century, Guy Callender, brilliant English physicist and very patient man who by hand uh, put together temperature measurements of the Earth and CO2 measurements of the Earth. And that graph there is the graph from his paper drawn by hand showing the correlation between the two. He was really the first person um, to actually record empirical observations of the enhanced greenhouse effect. He actually also thought that this was a good thing, possibly delaying the beginning of the next ice age. And finally, Charles Keeling. Inspired by the work of Calendar, Charles Keeling set up the first CO2 monitoring station at Mauna Loa in Hawaii, and that has been going ever since. And that curve, usually known as the Keeling curve, is perhaps one of the best known graphs that we have. The first mention of global warming in the scientific literature that anybody's been able to find was this one, published in Science in 1975 by Wally Broker, and he is actually still actively writing about climate change. And since then, scientists have been very busy. This is um, a graph of the number of papers in the Web of Science database with either climate change or global warming somewhere in the paper. And that's the cumulative number, nearly 300,000 papers published since 1980. And at least it does give me um, uh, comfort that the reason, for the reason that I can't keep up with the literature. It's about now 35,000 papers per year. Just as well, however, there's an organisation that Mary mentioned earlier that has been keeping up with the literature and has done a series of synthesis reports on climate science and its impacts. And I want to just very briefly take you through the five reports to identify how the language with which the IPCC has talked about climate change and its causes has changed over time. So the first assessment was in 1990, said, yes, warming has taken place, then about 0.3 to 0.6. Human, and they also said that human activities were substantially increasing uh, greenhouse gases, but they didn't actually draw the link between those two things. The second assessment report in 1995 said that the observed trends were unlikely to be entirely human in origin, still pretty cautious, pointing towards some sort of human influence on the climate. The third assessment, stronger evidence in 2001, 
um, that this warming was attributed to human activities. The fourth assessment, starting to get some pretty strong language now, warming is unequivocal and it's very likely due to human activity. And the final report, published in 2013, even stronger language. Once again, unequivocal warning, unprecedented rate of change, human influence on the climate system is clear and it is extremely likely that human activities are the dominant cause of warming. So over that period of time from 2000, uh, 1990 rather to 2013, um, the science really firmed up. I should also point out, and I was involved in this report, so this is not being too defensive, um, it's probably the most scrutinised set of reports in history. Amongst other things, there are 142,000 comments on the four drafts of the report, each of which was responded to in writing, and each of the comments and the responses are published. So why should we care about all of this? I want to deal with three sort of A words in this talk, and the first one is alarmist, because uh, climate scientists are often accused of this. We're accused of many things, but this is one. Um, an alarmist is defined as someone who exaggerates a danger and so causes needless worry or panic. Well, the first series of slides I'm going to show you are things that have already happened. They are not alarmist, but they certainly are alarming. If we go back to the times of ancient Egypt, 7,000 years ago, and then fast forward to the 70s, you might, you might think that men's fashion have, has gone backwards over that period, and we compare the rate of climate change during that period to the period between the 70s and last year, the climate has been changing in the last 40 years 170 times faster than in that previous 7,000 year period. And we can see this illustrated in this graphic which goes from the 1850s to last year showing month by month the increasing temperature of the planet, um, getting closer and closer to that 1.5 degree circle. I'll let it run to 2016 and you can see how close we've got. That's where we are now. And we're also at record CO2 levels, at least records for the last 5 million or so years. Uh, 406.94 parts per million is the latest figure from, 20, uh, from September. In the past, of course, CO2 has gone up and down. It's gone up and down between about 180 and 280 parts per million over time. Um, we're way outside that envelope now. So here's some, just some of the things that have been happening. About 99.9% .9 of glaciers on the planet are retreating. Here's an example. This is the Muir Glacier in North America, 1941, 1950, and 2004. And this is a very typical pattern. Why should we care about this? Well, this is the Tibetan Plateau. Um, it's one of the real hot spots of warming. It's warming at about twice the global average and it's the source of water for about a sixth of the world's population. You can think of glaciers as a big frozen dam. Once we've lost the glaciers, we've lost that reservoir of water. Um, about 20% of the world's population relies on glacier melt in that area. 500 of those glaciers have already completely disappeared. Similarly, polar ice is melting. This is a pic two pictures of Arctic summer ice extent, 1984 and 2016. Uh, the, the purple line is the uh, extent of winter ice, and you can see by looking at the white patch in the middle how Arctic ice has been shrinking. And in fact, this year, uh, polar ice, Antarctica and Arctic together, have hit record low amounts every single month this year. Together, glacier uh, melt and polar ice melt plus the warming of the oceans means that sea level rise is accelerating. It was about 2 millimetres per year last century. It's about 3.4 millimetres globally now. Here in Australia, we're not immune. 
About 50% of the Australian coastline is vulnerable to recession by the end of the century. Um, and the main thing, of course, that sea level rise does is increase the intensity and impact of storm surges. So in Sydney here, a one in a hundred year event could occur every day as a result of sea level rise by the end of the century. And of course, that's enormously important for our assets here uh, because most of us live on the coast. The sea is doing the planet enormous favours. It's absorbing about 93% of the excess warming and about 25% of the excess CO2 going into the atmosphere, but that's changing ocean chemistry and our global oceans are now about 25, uh, sorry, 30% more acidic than in pre-industrial times. And this is having major impacts already on marine food webs because it's making it more difficult for marine organisms to lay down their shells and skeletons. We all know that coral reefs are bleaching. This picture was taken at Heron Island about last September. We've had catastrophic bleaching over the last two years. Over 93% of individual reefs have suffered some bleaching. Uh, about 50% of the bleach coral has died. Um, and this has real economic impacts as well as environmental impacts because the reef brings in about $7 billion to the Australian economy and employs between 60 and 70,000 people, mostly in Queensland. And it's also getting hot. Moving on to land, heat waves are getting longer, hotter and occurring more often. In Europe in 2003, there was a three-week heat wave in summer there were 70,000 premature deaths, places like France, Germany and Spain suffering particularly. A few years later in Russia, 56,000 premature deaths in a heat wave there. And here in Australia, our bushfire seasons are getting longer and more intense, as are our heat waves. Um, we can all remember the 173 people that died in the Black Saturday bushfires in 2009. What most people don't realise is that about twice that number died the week before due to excessive heat conditions across southeast Australia. In the North Atlantic, as we've seen this year, major, major cyclones. Uh, Harvey has caused $100 billion worth of damage, making 2017 the costliest insurance year in history. And this is just, it's a fairly old graph, it only goes up to 2007, but it's the uh, frequency of um, North Atlantic tropical storms and the pattern is pretty stark. 20, 2007 to 2016 saw a 46% increase in weather-related disasters across the, across the world. This has been collated by the Lancet Health Countdown Report. 2015, 19 million people displaced. Um, we think we've got a refugee problem now. Think about what the refugee problem might be in the future. So now I want to talk about tipping points. Um, as defined here, it's a point at which a number of small changes, when added together, become significant and make larger and sometimes more sudden transformational changes. So all the things I've shown you so far are things that have already happened. Looking forward to the future, um, I want to talk about very briefly about some of the tipping points of most concern. Between 1 and 3 degrees, and we're at about 1.1 now, between 1 and 3 degrees, it's pretty much all about loss. It's projected that we'll lose our warm water corals, we'll lose our summer ice in the Arctic, irreversible um, loss of ice from the West Antarctic ice shelf um, and Greenland, and we will lose most of the glaciers by three degrees. At three to five degrees, we will lose at least a sixth of our species. The Amazon will probably change into savannah, and we could get a complete overturning of the thermohaline circulation. Sorry, that's been advancing a bit fast. Uh, complete overturning of the thermohaline uh, circulation with extraordinary and uh, chaotic uh, impacts on climate. At four degrees, we get submergence of land currently occupied, and this is without storm surge impacts, 
by 470 to 760 million people, mostly living on small island states or in the mega deltas of Southeast Asia, such as the Ganges. Beyond five degrees, um, we basically lose the Arctic summer ice um, and we get uh, enormous melting of permafrost in the Northern Hemisphere with uh, vast quantities of methane released into the atmosphere, uh, which is about 20 times the potency of CO2 as a greenhouse gas. This is John Schellenhuber. He's probably the most famous and influential climate scientist that most people have never heard of. He came up with um, amongst other things, the two-degree target that was eventually embodied in the Paris Climate Agreement. He was here a few years ago for a conference and he was asked this question, what's the difference between a two-degree world and a four-degree world? And his answer was as blunt as it was brutal. Human civilization. If John Schellenhuber's worried, we should all be worried. So this is a question, what are our chances here? Well, one of the ways of calculating our chances is using this mathematics problem, the carbon budget. It was devised a few years ago. John Shell and Uber had a big hand in it. And it's basically because we understand the relationship between greenhouse gases and warming, we can actually calculate how many more atoms of carbon we can put into the atmosphere to get a certain amount of warming compared to how many we've already put there. And this is what it looks like. So for 2015, which is when the last really um, thorough calculations of the ca carbon budget were made, it was calculated that to keep warming to two degrees or below, we've already spent 71% of that carbon budget. And at present rates of emission, we've got about 20 years left. For a 1.5 degree um, target, we've spent 95% of that carbon, three years of emissions left, but that's from 2015, so you can do the maths on that. Which leads to this concept, unburnable coal. It's a direct uh, uh, follow on from the carbon budget. And it's been calculated that both globally and in Australia, uh, about 90% of our known extractable coal reserves need to stay in the ground and unburnt. How are we doing globally? Well, this is the emissions over the last few years since 1990. We were doing quite well, actually, up until last year because they looked like they'd levelled off. We had three years of level emissions and everybody was pretty hopeful about that. Uh, but this year has seen a surge, 2% increase in 2017, one of the largest single surges in emissions of any year. The UN just released an emissions gap report <coughs> highlighting that we've got more CO2 in the atmosphere now than in any time in the last five million years and that last time CO2 was this high. Um, sea levels were about 20 metres higher and global temperatures two to three metres higher, which indicates that that's what we're sort of locked into. Importantly, they also um, uh, released information that said that the current pledges to the Paris Climate Agreement are only about a third of what is absolutely necessary for the two degree target. We were doing quite well for a while here in Australia. If you just look at this red line, which is Australian emissions between June 2011 and June uh, 2015, just look at the red. Um, this was when the carbon price was imposed. It had an immediate impact. This was when it repealed, also an immediate impact. Um, it's very clear evidence that a carbon price sets a very, very clear and effective sig signal on emissions. In fact, Australian emissions have risen every quarter since then, uh, particularly strongly since March 2015. Australia's commitment to Paris is for a 26 to 28% reduction of emissions um, compared to 2005 levels by 2030. Um, this is despite the fact that the government's own advisers, the Climate Change Authority, recommended a 40 to 60% target. How well are we doing? Well, not too good. An independent organisation called Climate Action Tracker that monitors uh, countries' commitments estimates that we're actually on track for a 27% increase rather than a 26 to 28% decrease by our target year. 
and noted that Australia stands out as having the largest gap between its pledge and its trajectory. And I realise you won't be able to read this, and I'll point out where Australia is on this list in a moment. This is the top 58 emitters in the world, ranked every year in terms of their climate performance. We've done a little bit better this year because we're only fifth last, um, beating Japan, Korea, Kazakhstan and Saudi Arabia. Usually we're third last, only beating Kazakhstan and Saudi Arabia. Which brings me to the message. Why is the message so hard to deliver? Well, actually, there's a lot of psychological research about this now, and I'm not going to go through it all, but rather I want to give you my take on it, having been publicly speaking about this topic for many years now. And I think it's actually absolutely understandable and totally explicable why this message is so hard. It's complicated we often show really, really complicated things like these graphs. And scientists, being cautious people, use words like this, probability, should, could, might, uncertain, likely. Um, those qualifiers actually make the message easier to ignore. It's scary. I've shown you a whole bunch of really scary things this morning. I don't make apologies for that. It's really sad. Those of us especially that work on species issues uh, wake up pretty sad. It's often presented as merely an environmental problem. And I put only there in inverted commas, of course. It is an environmental problem. It's an enormous environmental problem. But it's not just that. It's an economic problem. It's a health problem. It's a social problem. It's a society problem. But presenting it only as an, an environmental problem also makes it easier for lots of people to ignore it. It can seem a long way off. I've showed you some pretty apocalyptic predictions. Uh, they're hard to take in. And it can also seem like it's really only happening to other people a long way away. Another problem is the time lag in the climate system. You can turn off the tap of emissions, but warming will still continue for many decades to come and sea level rise would still continue possibly for millennia. There is no instant gratification in climate policy in terms of the actual climate. There are many loud and powerful and rich wealthy voices and ideologies arrayed against the message for all sorts of reasons. Some of the media, and not all of the media, it's improved enormously in the last 10 years or so, continues to focus on what is now a completely and utterly false scientific debate. And of course, we all have other important concerns, whether, they're, whether North Korea is going to blow something up or whether we can, uh, our kids can afford uh, a house. These are all totally legitimate concerns that are in our faces all of the time and it's easy to put off thinking about climate change as a more distant, less important prospect. And of course, climate change is a tragedy of the commons problem like no other. There is no more common resource than the Earth's climate system. It embodies this problem. But we shouldn't beat ourselves up too much because Australian attitudes have certainly been changing. And this is the last hurrah of the Climate Institute, uh, a survey of 2,500 Australians uh, published just a few months ago. And this is some of the, the stuff that they found. They, oh, sorry, go back. They found that 71% of Australians accept that climate change is occurring, that 66% have a high level of concern, that 87% don't want us to step back from our Paris targets, with 61% wanting us to try harder. 72% think that governments should be phasing out coal-fired power stations. And an absolutely stunning 96% approval rating for renewable energy sources. 
So we're not doing too badly on the uh, community attitudes. And I think this does highlight the vast discrepancy between climate policy, at least at the federal level, not so much at the state level, I hasten to add in this uh, Parliament House, um, and community attitudes here in Australia. So finally, how should scientists actually respond to all of this? Well, sometimes, well, often, actually, every day, it feels like this, the man on the wire. Because on the one hand, we need to be honest about the risks and about what the science is showing us. On the other hand, we know that always talking about catastrophe um, is pretty off-putting and pretty demotivating. So we also need to talk about all the positive things, the great strides in renewable energy, the prospect of a clean, green future and all of the health and other benefits that flow from that. I think the person, the quote that sums this up the best, both in the minds of individual uh, scientists and in probably in the community in general, sorry, go back, this is really out of control, this device, um, uh, was by a Marxist Italian politician last century who said, he talked about the struggle between the pessimism of the intellect and the optimism of the will. And he wasn't talking about climate change at the time, but I think that quote sums up perfectly this dilemma between the concerning catastrophic things and the hope for a new future. Uh, it's a quote that I really uh, think about almost every day. My colleague John Cook at University of Queensland is responsible for this famous figure now. He did this in his PhD and he, he looked at lots and lots of scientific papers on climate change um, and scored them as to whether they agreed that uh, climate change was being caused by human activities or not. And he found a stunning 97% attributed climate change to human activity. He then did something really interesting. He also surveyed the public as to their perception of scientific consensus, and this is what he found. Only 45% said that they thought there was scientific agreement, and 55% said that there was still a great deal of uncertainty and debate. Once again, an enormous discrepancy between actual consensus and the perception of consensus. And that's a very important thing because we know from psychological research that if you think some, a lot of people are agreeing with something, you're more likely to agree yourself. The best way I can use to um, sort of as an analogy of this, because climate scientists do seem to be held to a significantly higher burden of proof than most other experts um, in our society. Let me explain it like this. If you turned up to the airport and were about to get on this plane, and sorry Qantas, I don't want to just pick on you, um, and there were 100 aeronautical engineers standing around that plane and 97 of them said, actually we think we're pretty sure it might crash on the next flight. And three of them said, actually, we think it's OK. Well, would you get on the plane? Probably not. Would you take your family with you? Almost definitely not. You would trust those 97 aeronautical scientists with your life. Climate scientists, I'm afraid, don't have that same level of luxury. A few years ago, Joe Duggan, um, an artist and academic at ANU, decided to explore how climate scientists actually feel about what they do. And he wrote to 40 people, I was one of them, and asked them to write him a handwritten letter describing their feelings. We're not often asked about our feelings. We're often asked about our facts and our observations, but not our feelings. Um, and you can go online and read these letters. These are some of the sort of words that uh, I just sort of went through a half a dozen of those letters uh, when preparing for this talk. And these are some of the words that those scientists from all over the world actually used. A minority of them also had some positive things to say, things like hope, optimism, unwilling to give up. Which brings me to the five main things I've learnt in trying to communicate this message. They're not rocket science, uh, but they're meaningful to me. 
The first is that just doing more of this isn't enough. Living in our little academic bubbles, producing more and more and more worthy papers, while worthy, is not enough to get the message out. We know that more information does not necessarily lead to more understanding, and we further know that more understanding doesn't necessarily lead to more action, number one. We do need to continually search for more narratives that are local and meaningful to people. We often talk about things and show images of things like this, the poor old polar bears. People feel sad about that, but it's easy to forget them. What instead we need to be doing is talking about the things that really matter to people, their families, their family's security, their own security, their household economics. Then there's my second A word, advocacy. It's often considered a dirty word in relation to scientists. It actually means public support for or recommendation of a particular cause or policy. My third thing that I've learnt is that advocacy is absolutely not a dirty word and no scientist should be afraid of it. In fact, just yesterday or the day before, there was this headline. Our chief scientist, Alan Finkel, said that he supported a 50% renewable target based on this report that was just published a couple of days ago by the Australian Council of Learned Academies. And I figure if the chief scientist can be an advocate of strong, effective climate policy, any scientist should feel comfortable with being an advocate also. Fourthly, we need to overwhelm, just as Gramsci talked about, the negative with the positive. There are many negatives, including many things that I've said to you today, but there are huge positives as well. There is a tidal wave of uh, renewable energy projects developing around the world, a little bit slow in Australia, but elsewhere they're really picking up. Um, there is modelling to suggest that we can get to 40% renewable energy by 2040, um, with lots of businesses plunging in and investing. Uh, that uh, rather spacey figure there is the solar plant in Spain. We also need to emphasise that this is achievable. Just a couple of days ago, California announced that they will get to their 50% renewable target not in 2030, which is when they plan to do it, but in 2020. And finally... We simply cannot, as scientists, be terribly effective alone, um, as indicated here by this uh, John Kuldecker cartoon. And I do want to just acknowledge, from a personal perspective, four organisations that I've worked with and continue to work with um, that really uh, is an embodiment of the idea that scientists need to work in teams with economists, with psychologists, with social scientists, with digital technologists, with engineers, with lots and lots of people. So let me quickly acknowledge WWF, a science-based conservation organisation, does a lot of work on climate, and I'm constantly blown away at every board meeting, the breadth and depth and sophistication of their activities, both here and elsewhere. The Wentworth Group, there's a few of them here today, so it better be nice. Um, a crazy, eccentric, lovable bunch of people uh, that came together with the express purpose of uh, giving environmental policy in Australia a solid scientific basis. The Climate Commission, um, a really unique experiment by the Gillard government of actually getting a group of people, myself included, to go around Australia for two and a half years talking about climate science to public audiences. And if you're um, looking at this slide uh, carefully, you will see the now Prime Minister up there at the back asking us a question in Parliament House at one of those forums. Um, it was a wild roller coaster, stressful, frustrating, but ultimately satisfying and enjoyable ride. Um, the only downside really being having us all being in receipt of regular letters from a certain Malcolm Ewan Roberts um, <laughs> that were frankly so barking mad, I threw them in the bin immediately to my later regret. Ima imagine how much I could have got for them on eBay these days, but really, who knew? <laughs> <laughs> 
And finally, last but certainly not least, the Climate Council. The, the Climate Commission was abolished on the second day of the Abbott government. We realised that our work was far from done. We set up the Climate Council and asked the public to support us. Four years later, we're still going strong um, and have, I hasten to add, outlived the Abbott Prime Ministership. Um, and this is a group that, to me, it's, it's like my second family, but it embodies this idea of a team effort. We have economists, social, social media people. Uh, we have former executives of electricity companies and the oil and gas industry. Many, many people working together with a shared goal um, to inform the public so they can make informed choices. Which brings me back to James Hansen. Here he was in 1988 again. Here he is in 2015 at the Paris Climate Meeting. He's had a bit of a rearrangement of facial hair in that time. Um, and he was a pretty dour guy, I think, in 1988. But believe you me, he's a very grumpy old man now. And frankly, having talked about this stuff for 30 years and seeing what's happening or not happening, who could blame him? In 2009, he went outside his usual uh, publishing milieu and published this book. It's called Storms of My Grandchildren. It's got a pretty clunky subtitle, but I'll read it out. The Truth About the Coming Climate Catastrophe and Our Last Chance to Save Humanity. Um, here's James Hansen again getting arrested. And he's been arrested multiple times now. And he's been criticised. This was over the um, gas pipeline, I think, this particular arrest. He's been widely criticised, uh, sometimes by his fellow scientists, and this is my third A word, activist, for doing this sort of thing. A person who campaigns to bring about political or social change. I don't think that's a bad badge to have at all. And for me, the fact that James Hansen, who worked for 46 years at NASA, has written over 200 climate science papers, um, and has received more medals than um, any scientist could possibly uh, hope to receive in their career. If he's willing to get arrested for it, well, that should give us all pause. In November 2015, uh, three quarter, more than three quarters of a million people marched um, to support climate action just before the climate summit in Paris. And I want to leave you with my favourite placard from those marches, and it's this one. We are the ones we have been waiting for, because what this says to me is that this is not just about what scientists need to do and communicators need to do. It's not just about engineers building better solar panels or business people making good investment decisions, and even it's not just about politicians making well-informed, science-based climate policy. It's actually about all of us. Because after all, we're all on this planet together. Thank you very much. And I suspect we have questions. So, who wants to go first? Oh, sorry. Oh, well, no. yeah. Here comes. My name is Robert Vinson. I've um, helped write the Kyoto Protocol, Article 3.4 in particular. I spent the last eight years in China, Mongolia, lowering eight billion tonnes of CO2 by growing soil in the desert. Climate change is not new to the planet. It's occurred many times before, and in those days, nature self-repaired. There were no factories and there were no clean energy. Nature has the solutions. It's land use, land use change today where the greatest problem is. It's a half a billion dollars, uh, a half a trillion dollars for Australian industry to actually reverse our deserts, lower CO2, restore it to how it was, grow the soil, and allow some of it also to feed a hungry world because we're losing 24,000 babies a day. What's your question? My question is, why can't we, as a panel, sit together and implement what we do in China and UN and World Bank, and they want me to do in Africa, grow the 2 to 4% of vegetation, 
in Australia, set up a committee and do it here? Um, well, look, I agree with all of that, mostly. Um, I, I absolutely agree that better land management and certainly reversing land clearing and better uh, soil management is absolutely critical because land use change does contribute an uh, enormous amount of climate change that we see today, not all of it. Um, and yes, I, I absolutely agree that's something we have to do. Um, but that's not all we have to do because just doing that isn't enough if we're still continually putting carbon into the atmosphere from the Earth's crust as a one-way street. So while the land has enormous possibilities to become a bigger sink for carbon, it cannot balance um, the entire amount of fossil fuel um, induced emissions going into the atmosphere. So it's part of the solution. I'm afraid it's not the only solution. But please talk to my Wentworth Group colleagues about that. Howard Witt from uh, Citizens Climate Lobby. Um, Citizens Climate Lobby promotes the uh, carbon pricing scheme that Dr Hansen uh, put forward in storms of my grandchildren. Um, unlike uh, Dr Hansen, I'm not a famous scientist, but I am also a grandfather and uh, I'm also particularly worried about my grandchildren and hence I lobby for Citizens Climate Lobby. Um, I'd like to know your opinion on James Hansen's carbon pricing scheme that we promote. Thank you. Hmm. Look, I'm not um, a carbon pricing expert. I'm an ecologist, not an economist. And um, perhaps like Dr Finkel, I'm agnostic as to the, uh, the details of um, which scheme that a gov any particular government does. So I won't comment on James... I know, I know about James Hansen's scheme. Uh, it might work, it might not. The proof of the pudding of any carbon reduction scheme or carbon pricing scheme is in the atmosphere. So I'm, all I will say is I'm in favour of any pricing scheme that results in emissions declining to zero by 2050 because unless we do that, we're in real trouble. But the details should be left to the expert economists. Um, I'm just here to say they need to get on with it. Hi, Hi my name's um, Edwin Clapworthy. I'm a PhD student in chemistry at the University of Sydney. My question is, do you think scientists, uh, more scientists, should be just running for parliament because it's our elected representatives who have continually failed us over the past decades? I mean, either, th either through willful ignorance, corruption or stupidity, they reject reports from scientists left, right and centre. So why don't we put more of us in the positions that matter? Um, yeah. <laughs> Can I just add, I'm not saying all parliamentarians, but the current government is a good example of those failing us. Yeah. Um, look, look, I agree, and it, I think it would be fantastic if more scientists were in parliament as well. Um, it, you know, if they're good people, not all scientists are good, not all scientists are smart, um, but certainly it would be great to see. Yeah, of course, yes. I think it's probably a bit more than 97% now. That's actually an old figure, yeah. Sure. Um, my name's Clayton Barr. I'm a member of New South Wales Parliament. <laughs> well done. Um, I believe in the science. Um, I guess as a politician, I observe the politic and the psychology of this and what I see, the fundamental position that politicians seem to go to is this fear and scaremongering about financially how it will impact the family mm -hmm. and they win the vote on fear mm -hmm. of finance. Mm -hmm. How do, we, how do we address that? Mm -hmm. Because that's kind of where the political fight is happening mm. and that's the great shame. Yeah. Look, I agree with you. It's very easy to use sort of trite, scaremongering, short-term scaremongering tactics. But, I mean, the science is there to support the economics now. You know, it is far cheaper. I think it's 8.2 cents a kilowatt hour for new wind power and it's 11 cents per kilowatt hour for the best new coal-fired power station. So, you know, just comparing those two, solar's sort of a little bit more than wind. Um, th the economics actually do stack up for renewable energy. There's several reports out just in the last week that actually show that, including that Ecola report that I just mentioned, and one ca that came out about two or three days ago from UTS, showing that um, a 50% renewable target is cheaper um, than... Uh, business as usual. So the facts and figures are there. 
we just need to use the right ones um, rather than uh, appealing to the absolute lowest common denominator. But it also does come back to, to what I said about the narrative. We actually have to tell the narrative about economics, but I think we also have to tell the narrative about families. Um, you know, politicians have families too. Miners have families too. Um, we should be all being very, very concerned about the, the world that our children and grandchildren should inherit. Um, and that's the message that we have to sell even harder than the scaremongering about your next electricity bill. Thank you. Um, uh, just before asking um, my question, um, yeah, Ivan Kennedy, uh, University of Sydney, uh, retired from teaching after many years of working in the area of acidification of ecosystems and uh, also the risk management of agri agricultural chemicals, pesticides and so on. Um, but since I re retired from teaching, I've interested myself in climate change, science, um, just working with my own resources. And I, I've been struck... Uh, in the case of acidification, the problem was solved largely because I think the science was pretty straightforward and uh, we were able to write books that set out the chemistry involved so that as a result of government policy, uh, power stations were required to put limestone filters into the smokestacks. And that took 20, 25 years uh, in the United States for the science being understood to the legislation actually being fully uh, implemented. As well as that, there was a huge effort by, by government scientists and other scientists um, to do with uh, solving the problem of acidification in the field. Again, the solution was largely limestone, uh, transferring limestone from one place to another. Many soils were rehabilitated, our grain yields have increased. And so that there was local action, scientists could get involved in that. Uh, they knew what they were doing. The whole process, I think, was been pretty successful. And what's your uh, now, my question is, as far as the science is concerned, uh, uh, we set, I think we've focused today on what the political action that's required. Uh, but for government scientists uh, to manage to manage problems, you really need to have something to measure locally. And I want to suggest that what can be measured locally. Uh, is the amount of extra water going into the atmosphere? Yeah, as a result of agriculture. Uh, it, uh, worldwide. Uh, uh, let, let's just, yeah, we, we really have to move on. Yeah. Um, look, if, if climate change was solvable by um, distributing limestone around the place, that would be terrific. Um, I don't think measuring water going into the atmosphere is going to really cut it. Water vapour is actually quite a potent greenhouse gas. Um, as I indicated in the talk, it's a very complicated issue. There's no silver bullet. You know, one of my Climate Council colleagues, Jerry Houston, always talks about silver buckshot. We can't solve climate change with a single stroke. It is actually uh, going to be solved by multiple actions at the individual, the community, the business, the sub-national, the national and the international level. And they all are important and we need to do all of them. It's too big a problem and too complex a problem to even think that there might be a single solution. Right. And on that note, <coughs> I think something to think about. Firstly, can we say thank you? Been thank you very much. Thank you. series for the year and I'm just going to make a couple of announcements. Um, so the, for next year the, the notes will be coming out soon, the, the program of talks for the year. But you'll, the introductions will be done by somebody else. Most of you know I'm finishing as Chief Scientist and Engineer from the 31st of January and moving to another part-time position, um, chairing the Independent Planning Commission in New South Wales, what used to be known as the PAC, the Planning Assessment Commission. I'm going to miss you all. There's a bit of buyer's regret going on when I see all the friends here for such a great talk and for, who've been coming to these series. I'd like to particularly say thanks to you all for coming. Big thanks to Trevor Danos for thinking up the scheme. Big thanks to the Parliament for hosting us. And a very big thanks to my team.
I've been incredibly lucky in the nine years I've been chief scientist and engineer to have the most wonderful office, the most wonderful colleagues. And um, one of the things they all do is get involved in these breakfasts. So I'd actually like them to stand up for a minute because I, I, they have just been incredible. And, and with me gone, you need to know who the people are. The government has advertised the position, so I hope good people will step forward and um, I'll look forward to seeing you around. Thank you. Mary.